Hmm. There we go. Okay, took a minute to pop in. All right, I think we're good. I think we're good to go there. Fantastic, uh, Crystal. Very nice. To, is it? Is it? Did I pronounce that right, Crystal? Is it? Okay. Crystal. Very nice. Very nice to speak with you today. It looks like you've done a ton since you got the audit. You already you moved over to the feast theme. Mm -hmm. You've uh, knocked off a lot of things. Good. Good for you. And we're going to go over all that today to make sure that we dial as much as we can on the call today for you. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts after you're receiving the audit. Were, does there, was there anything that surprised you? What Were you expecting some of these issues? Tell me a little bit about that. So, like, your quote that you say a lot, I've watched, like, all your webinars, so uh, kind of, like, talking you. I can't even get my wife to watch one, so I do appreciate that. So just an FYI. You always say, like, you don't know what you don't know, but I feel like in my case, I thought I knew a lot and everything I knew was wrong. Mm. Like I know like keyword density is something you mentioned. Like I'm, you know, I have way too much of it. You know, I, I've taken SEO classes in the past that were like, make sure you use a different variety of your keyword and sure. you know, H2. Um, and so I just, I feel like I thought I knew what I was doing and I'm completely, completely off. Well, and again, and that's, and that's fine because Google changes so much. They push out 3000 plus updates a year. It used to be um, that we could put, um, your keyword in each of your H2s and we wouldn't have any big issues, but Google launched a new algorithm last fall that they've been running quietly for a year called BERT. It's a bio-directional encoding algorithm that looks at conversational content in a completely different way. It looks at the content before and after. It reads it backwards and forwards. I'm here, sorry. I <laughs> no. <laughs> no problem. And basically what happened was that when Google launched this, it started to really look at language more conversationally. And, and people don't talk the way that a lot of bloggers were optimizing their content. And so what was happening was a lot of bloggers who had been giving this information, and I can I probably name the SEO courses who were telling you to do this, were, you know, they got slammed. I can't tell you how many bloggers reached out to me in November and then again in January and again in May saying, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And they all shared this over optimization in their headings. They had been told to repeat their keyword basically everywhere they could possibly on the page. And Google moved beyond that a long time ago. We just, we don't need to do that. As long as we can reference the keyword in our H1 and in our recipe H card two and our recipe H2, you're good to go. And that's probably going to be, once you start to dial that back on examples like that banana cake you had, you're going to be shocked at how much easier it is for that to start building traffic and climbing. Is it the same thing with like keyword variations? Like, you know, if you look it up on SEM Rush, it'll say like easy banana cake, moist banana cake. So those are, yeah, those are, those are just uh, stems. So, I mean, if you wanted to like, if you want to put easy or quick or whatever in front of your, of the, of the title for your title, for your, for your Yoast title, mm -hmm. totally fine. It's not going to kill you. I always tell people it's intent. So I'd want you to go to Google and look and see what's ranking for banana cake. If you see people using easy and quick, then hey, you know that it's not going to affect you much at all. If you if you look down and you see that, you know, hey, there's these are exact match titles, maybe me putting easy and quick in is not necessarily the best way to match the intent that Google is returning for those queries specifically. So you don't have to add each like if like let's say the top three keywords five thousand easy banana cake four thousand quick banana cake three thousand moist banana cake you don't have to put in that article moist banana cake check out this like mm -hmm. that kind of goes what you're you don't yeah you don't talk about that like yeah you don't you could I mean the if you type in your if you when we go into search console today and pull up one of your recipes you'll see that there are literally hundreds of keywords tied to that post keywords that are not even on the page they're keywords that because someone is linked to you, someone has linked to you, maybe there's an internal link using easy, maybe there's an internal link using quick, you will routinely rank for hundreds of keywords that are not even remotely on the page or that you didn't even think about including in the title. Okay. But the most important thing is just to think, okay, I need to just stop worrying about optimizing for Google and optimize for my users. You know, here's why this recipe works. Step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, expert tips and FAQs. I don't need to say step-by-step -step instructions for banana cake. Expert tips and FAQs for banana cake. Step by, you know, all of that. We don't, we don't need to do that. We moved to, we moved beyond that months ago. 
Yeah, and if you haven't used Key Search, I think you're going to find that you're going to love that tool, keysearch.co. The thing that you have to understand is that SEMrush does not have a Google API. SEMrush uses what is called clickstream data. So it's a guess. So they're taking information in the search results, and then they're pulling that back and determine, okay, based upon this data, we can estimate that the volume of this keyword is this. Or based upon the fact that these two sites, we have access to their analytics information, maybe we could say that this keyword is this. Keysearch.co, as an example, is one of only a few keyword tools that actually has the access to the Google API. So you're going to get a little bit more accurate information than, say, SEMrush, which doesn't. It's just guessing. Okay. And I also tried a little, you know, again, you've heard me say toddlers and drunk adults a ton. Yeah. I want you to make keyword research should be as dead simple as possible, and that's why I like Keysearch.co because it'll tell you red yellow green here's the here's your site here's the strength of your site in comparison to everyone that's ranking on page one and oh by the way here are the keywords that the tool thinks that you're going to have the best chance to rank for and that's really simple you know it, it's going to provide it's going to take a lot of guesswork out of your keyword research specifically now You've gone through the audit obviously quite a bit. You've already moved to the fees theme. Tell me a little bit about what you've done already based upon the audit itself. Um, so moved to fees, new recipe index, new homepage. Um, that was like honestly a little bit of a shock to me. Like I'm sure it is to a lot of people, but you know, you have a designer come to you yeah. and they're like, yep. It'll be your baking beauty theme, and you'll be the only person in the world that has it. And I'm like, oh, you know, look at me, I'm so fancy, but really, it wasn't wasn't ideal. So um, I kind of like, you know, sad to see all that money go. But if it's better, it's better. Um, the thing about custom themes is that they did have their place years ago, and right now the problem is, is that if you get a custom theme, you're literally tying yourself to that designer long term, and you have to also you also have to accept that they have limitations. They don't know SEO. They're not designing the theme for accessibility. There might be changing metrics with Google that they're not able to push out on that theme specifically. Now, I will tell you, Lindsay's new themes are better than the one you have. Mm -hmm. She's because she, because again, I've audited like 50, 100 of her bloggers. And so every one of them goes back to her and say, why did you miss this? Why did you miss this? And she just got tired of it and finally coded all that stuff in. So it's getting better, but what I want you to start thinking about is future-proofing your SEO. And the good thing about moving to a feast theme is that all the functionality is built into the plugin. So now we're going to get all these new features that are going to be pushed out through the plugin, and you could be able to deploy them very quickly, not have to worry about it. You will do better because I can tell you right now your feast theme is already better. When you moved over, you had Nitro Pack. You've gone from the 70s to 80s already on all of your pages. So right there, that's a benefit. Now, there's a couple fonts that we need to possibly lazy load today, and we're going to do that in your plugin on the call. Okay. Yeah. I know you work with, um, I'm probably going to say your name wrong, Nagi, Recipe 10 Eats. Um, I read a blog post from her about how, how I got millions of page views with a $90 theme. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Yeah, no, no longer. I'm not sure if you've seen her current theme, but she spent about fifteen grand on it. Oh goodness! Okay. Wow. okay, and she had a and she had quote you know part of my language she had a shit ton of problems. She could not get the page speed to work. She was working with uh, Lauren um, over at Once Coupled, and it took a month to finally figure out what was going on. I I was consulting with them on it, and they finally got it figured out. But they wouldn't have had that issue if they hadn't gone the custom route. So they spent a significant amount of money over uh, what you are ever going to have to worry about spending now that you're on a more, you know, it's not a matter of it being a simplified theme. It's just a matter of it's being more easily supported. Yeah. Um, okay. The only other thing I did, I did delete a bunch of the, um, the no index no, stuff. Yeah. I think I only have two left. Oh, good for you. I know there was a lot in there. Yeah. And I, I'm deleting some other stuff. I think I've deleted as much as I feel comfortable deleting without further advice. No, exactly. We're going to look at that today. I would prefer that you try to recover as much as you can. I mean, if you think that there's something in there that we can republish and do a better job now that now that you have kind of a better template to work from, 
yeah. that's what we want to do. Uh, you have a lot of that. This still one of your biggest things that I see is you still have a lot of empty category pages. By empty, I mean you have a ton of category pages that only have one post, two posts, three posts in them. No real value to those because they're not going to do anything for you. There's just not enough content in them. Now, if you think that you will eventually fill them out, then by all means, keep them. But if you think that you're not, don't worry about just deleting them as well. And then we'll delete them. We run the broken link checker and we correct any internal links to those now deleted categories. Okay. Oops, you dropped out of there. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Okay, good. I hear you. All right. So you've already moved to the modern homepage. Um, we'll make some slight edits to that. Looks like you did a pretty good job. Want to make sure the H1 is correct and, and all the rest of that. Looks like you corrected your sidebar already. You actually added the names of the recipe so that people know what's going on with you your did, sidebar. You well, just did that for me. Basically. Who, who did? Beast, like the theme. Oh, like it's something fantastic. To yeah, good. Yeah, that's all, that's all good. Um, did you understand the things, the blog fixer recommendations? Did you understand, like, for example, the incorrect use of the link targets, the fact that we had, we need to unlink images when we insert them, the miss and no follow links, those three issues yeah. specifically? Um, I bought four of his things. Okay. Christopher's good. He'll run a whole scan on it, and if he thinks, he might say, okay, maybe you want to consider this fix. Don't think that you have to buy all the fixes at all. As a matter of fact, if you want to forward me the list, he might run like a like a analysis, like a, okay, hey, I found these other issues. Do you want to fix them? Most of his fixes you don't need. The fixes I pointed out you should get because they're going to improve usability and the flow of page rank through your site specifically. But things like removing extra periods, not necessary. Or uh, there's, I think he offers an affiliate link fix in that case, probably not necessary to get that. But as long as you've taken advantage of the, like I said, the no follow the link target and the, what was it, the uh, um, image unlink, you're good to go. I don't expect that you're going to have any other issues there. Did anything else, did you, did anything else out of the audit jump out at you like, oh my gosh, besides the, the headings and. Um, the. The meta ones, um, so tell me if I'm completely wrong on this, but I feel like someone told me that like Google doesn't have to pull that. They might pull it, but they might show something else instead. Is that mm -hmm. true? Oh, yeah. Google ignores meta descriptions all the time. The problem okay. is if you don't fill it out, they're definitely going to ignore it, and then you don't have any control over what's there. So we always want to fill out meta descriptions whenever we can. Now, the good news is, is that I'm going to be able to go online today, Crystal, and we're going to go into your Yoast plugin, and I can put a, a parameter called an excerpt. I can put an excerpt parameter under pages and posts. And so what it'll do is it'll tell Yoast to pull up the first crawlable content on the page. In many cases, that'll be your teaser text. Okay. So that's a backup, and that'll be automatically, that'll automatically fill in all of your missing meta descriptions for a crawler. But it's just a stopgap. You still need to start thinking about going back and putting in custom meta descriptions when you can because we want to sell the click whenever we can. We always want to control that space, especially if someone's going to share the content to Facebook or somewhere else because that's where they're going to be pulling that sharing snippet is the meta description. Okay. I guess I just heard somewhere like, oh, they don't really care about us. So I was like, fine, I'll give up. <laughs> All good. Uh, meta descriptions are not used algorithmically, but they're very important for conversion. You know, a good meta description, well, there are numerous studies out there showing that a good meta description can increase whether or not you're going to get clicked in the search results considerably. So, again, it's not going to kill you, but we want to fill that out. Same way with the, what do we have, the multiple H1s? I think most of those posts are actually gone now. Again, there's not many. What was there? There's like 12, 13 of them. The Looks like most of them are, are uh, yeah, makeup reviews and stuff. So, yeah, if you deleted those, you had most of them no indexed anyway. So, yeah, all good. That's that's not going to hit you. Tell me a little bit about your content focus. Are you going to continue to do these these cosmetic and beauty reviews in the future, or is that just something that you passing passing phase? To be honest, the reason I did it was to get free stuff. Oh, sure. I, and, again, I would never fault you for doing that at all. I mean, it's just – it used to be that the, the 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 environment now for a blogger like you is completely different than it was just three years ago. 
it's very competitive. The amount of vloggers now, as opposed to three years ago, is up like almost a thousand percent. It's ridiculous. It, there are something like uh, new ten new food bloggers entering the niche every day, or something like that. Some crazy, crazy number, or even an hour. It's it's huge. And things that worked a couple years ago just don't work anymore. Like cross links. I know that you had a lot of reciprocal linking on your site with a couple small amount of sites. It's okay to have that. It's just not something that is ever really going to do much for you. It might generate some traffic between the sites, but Google tends to ignore those links um, overall. So, you know. I'm going to remove them. They weren't actually cross links. I don't think they ever really linked to me. It was kind of me linking to them in the hopes that they would link to me. Ah, okay. It really worked. So. Well, I only found a couple. I put them in order of the links that I found on your site, and then I looked at your backlink profile, and I only saw a couple dozen links overall between those sites and yours. So clear, so it was really strange. I thought, well, maybe they removed the links to you. It wasn't working. Also, um, I guess it was me misunderstanding. Um, you know, you say link out to qualified. Oh, you know, I was thinking. Okay, well, if they wrote a peanut butter chocolate chip cookie recipe and I wrote a chocolate chip cookie recipe, I'll link to it versus now I understand that linking to a quality resource might be like, check out these 10 tips to bake perfect cookies from Better Yeah, Pentagon. exactly. External links, and this is something that bloggers are confused about, so don't, don't feel bad about it. External linking is not a ranking factor, okay? Google has said that multiple times. What external links do is add context for your users, and they provide a resource so that you can provide them a more fulfilling search experience. So if you, as you said, if you've got a great resource on chocolate chip cookies, but you know there's a couple things you can link out to that will add context to what you're pr trying to present, we always want to do that. Okay. Always. We want to link out when it makes sense. A lot of the SEO courses, your rate are like, oh my gosh, you need to have two external links in your post. And that kind of nonsense has not been true for years. We link out when it makes sense to users. We don't try to stuff external links in a post just because some formularic blogging course tells us we should. It's all good. So in your case, again, I know you've gone through a lot. We're going to cover all that today. Think of your site as a chair with three legs. Leg number one is the technical issues. The fact that you've now moved from that previous theme to feast is going to significantly take care of a lot of those technical issues. We're going to be able to remove some needless CSS and JavaScript that was going on. Lindsay might have pretty themes, but they're always stuffed with excessive JavaScript and CSS that you don't need. We're also going to, of course, now be able to fully optimize your category pages. We're going to show you that today. We also want to make sure accessibility-wise, because you've moved off of Lindsay's theme, you have corrected, without you having to do anything, several of your accessibility issues, especially with the modern homepage, very quickly. So you might have some color contrast issues left, but it's not a big deal. I can send you a referral to someone or you can work on that yourself. You seem, you seem to be pretty technically self-sufficient, so to, to correct color contrast issues, you just use a color contrast tool. And then you put in the foreground color and the background color. And our goal is to get to a four to three, four, three to one, so to speak. So it's just a contrast. We have to make sure that there's enough contrast between the background and the foreground so that you pass what's called double A and triple A accessibility compliance. Okay. Technical issue wise, we'll make sure that we don't have any uh, chain redirects on your server. You're still with WP Opt, is that right? Okay, and you're happy with Charles Services, no problems? Yeah, you did um, one or two spots in the audit. You recommend something about, like, oh, it should be fine, but, like, something's not fine or something. Yeah, we'll check it and make sure that you don't have a server redirect on your site. Um, you did generate, you generated what are called, excess, you generated excessive DOM nodes on your site. Web vitals are a little low, but it's not really a big deal. The thing to understand about Charles' servers is he uses the, his own – his servers are not web-based. They're actual physical servers. And so cloud-based serving is really kind of where the future is. 
Okay, you're always going to be a little bit faster. You can stay with Charles, totally fine, especially if you're getting good support. Or you can start looking ahead at, okay, as my traffic grows, I'm going to need something that's a little bit more faster, something that provides a little bit more elasticity. And that's where that's where Big Scoots and Flywheel and some of the other hosts come into play. Different server technology. But like I said, if you're totally comfortable with Charles, no reason to change. All good. I just, yeah, I think I paid for the year, so yeah. probably six months. All good. I just want you to know from me, you know how many audits I've done. It's literally like a thousand audits. And I'll have an audit on Monday that says, man, Charles is just terrible. He never gets back to me on my support request. And then I'll have someone on Wednesday say, yeah, Charles is great. He gets back to me immediately. So it's just very uneven. So I just have to ask the blogger every time, are you happy with your support? Because that's yeah. what's very important long term. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so ten yeah, so technical issues wise, we'll go over that. I'm going to run a database optimization plugin for you today. I've reset your broken link checker. Uh, when you installed the broken link checker and set it up, there's a couple settings you missed. All good, but we I reran it, so we're going to rerun it while it's on the call today, and make sure that we're catching everything we can catch. Um, orphan content filter. Did you understand that in the post in in the audit? I had you install and upgrade to US Premium for two reasons. The first one was so that you had this orphan content filter. And what that is, is it shows you all the content on your site that doesn't contain links from anything else. Those are content islands. In many cases, all we have to do, Crystal, is send links to the posts that don't have links to them currently, and traffic goes up because those are hard to find. The only way Google is finding those is possibly from your sitemap. So when we have content on our site that's not linked internally from other pieces of content, that's a low quality signal to Google. So we want to increase internal linking whenever we can. And so the orphan content does that pretty well. It allows you to see at a glance, here's everything on the site that is not linked from anything else. Now the second reason I had you upgrade to, to Yoast Premium was for the redirect manager. You've been using it, I assume you've been, so that when you when you delete something, it'll pop up a little it should pop up two options for you at the top of the page. One of them says, do you want to redirect this? Or one of them says, do you want to serve a 410? Have you been seeing that? Yes, but I have not done anything with it. Okay. We always, when we remove content, we always want to click on serve a 410. Because when we serve a 410, we're telling Google, I want this out of the index as fast as possible. Usually we can get the content out of the index twice as fast with a 410 as opposed to a 404 because Google will keep crawling the 404 several times, whereas with a 410, they'll crawl it once and process it immediately. Okay. Okay, so no problem. You're only ever going to redirect something on your site that is an exact match, like we redirect a blueberry pie to a blueberry pie. We would never redirect a blueberry pie to an apple pie or a blueberry pie to a pies category or a blueberry pie to your homepage. Okay, because when we do that, the redirect will work. Google will ignore the redirect. They treat it as what's called a soft 404. That means they're going to crawl it, but they're not going to follow the redirect because the content is dissimilar. And it's a change in search intent. Does that make sense? Is that true? Like a lot of the things I deleted were getting like maybe like five hits a year. Is it still necessary to do the 410? Yeah, because yeah, because we can get it out of the index faster. But it, but if you if you've already gone through and deleted a lot of stuff, we don't need to go back and correct it. We'll just leave them as 404s or whatever it is. All good. I feel like all those alerts are still. Are they? We'll take a look at it when we get into the site today. So those are the two main reasons we want to upgrade to to Yoast Premium, and, and just use that in the future when you delete something, click the 410, so we can create the 410. The page on your site will still say a 404, but the server heading will say a 410. Okay. Now, uh, moving over to the second leg. Second leg of a chair. Think of your size as a chair with three legs. Second leg is the content. Your content's pretty good. It's just not as high as meets needs as it could be. Did you understand when I graded the content and then I showed you a couple other examples of what I kind of want you to emulate? We want to be looking at making sure that we're providing a clear roadmap in the content to what the user needs to make this recipe perfectly. Now you were using table of contents. The problem is, is that you had popped a table of contents site wide and that hurt you. Did that make sense? That section there? Yeah, I don't know how to fix it. I agree it looks terrible. Um, do I manually? 
Yeah, you have, have to man you have to manually go in and remove the short code. Yeah, so you can manually go in. Now, one of the things that you might want to do if you know that it's going to be a long project is I'm going to provide you lists of VAs. This is an example where you can just have a VA go in and do that stuff for you very inexpensively. Another option would be for you to reach back out to Christopher over at the Block Fixer and see if he can do a custom fix for you where he looks for that short code and removes it. But the problem with that is that he probably remove it from everything and we don't want to do that. So you're going to probably have to physically just determine, you're going to have to go in, remove the short code from those thin content examples. We only use a table of content when it makes sense. So on your more recent content where the content is a little bit more detailed. With regards to the recipe template, did that, did you understand when I was trying to communicate in the recipe template? Because when we're looking, uh, you're again, competitive niche, you're competing against millions of food bloggers. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that your recipes are highest meets needs. And that means a nice labeled photo of the ingredients. That means putting the elements in the correct order. A lot of bloggers make the mistake of putting ingredients and then they put tips and then they put step by step. That's wrong. If you think about it, we don't tell someone how to make something perfectly before we show them how to make it. So we show them how to make it step by step. And then and only then is there a tips and expert tips, tips and FAQs below that. Okay. And that's something that a lot of bloggers, even the biggest bloggers in the world, they, they're like, they don't understand human nature. But when you've done these focus groups, and we ask people, hey, what do you want to see on a recipe? How, how do you want a recipe to look? It's always the same thing. I'm like, I'm always confused when they start the, the post with these huge sections on the ingredients and, and tips and tricks before I even know where the steps are to make the recipe. I just want to jump down to the recipe card and get out of there. So we don't want to do that. We want to keep them on the page. And to do that, there's a very specific template that I found works well. So again, it's just very quickly, you know, we have a nice... The headline, we have the teaser text, we have why this recipe works as an H2. Why this recipe works, it could just be a couple paragraphs of you saying, this is fantastic for holidays, or my kids love this, or this is better than the million of other recipes because of this. Whatever it is, that's you selling the user on why this recipe is better than the million of other options. And then the next section, of course, is the recipe ingredients. And this is where we have a nice photo, a nice laid out photo of all the ingredients. People are visual learners, but it's even more so when they walk through uh, the grocery store. They're walking through the grocery store, and I can't tell you how many people have told me when we do these focus groups, man, I love this, Casey. I love being able to look at the photo of all the labeled ingredients, and I can just grab it from myself. I don't have to – I don't. I, it's one of those um, – it's basically like a zombie state where you don't really have to pay – close attention to anything, you, and that's what it is, is we're making it as easy as possible for the users to see here are the ingredients, grab them off the shelf. And then in that same section, we don't need to list all the ingredients and explain them. That's what your recipe card is for. The only time you should be talking about your ingredients in the recipe post is when you can add expertise to those ingredients. So for example, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you some examples today where squash was required and she talks about here's the type of squash you use or by the way you can use cabacho or delicato or something else but we don't need to list sugar or margarine if there's not something specific about the sugar or margarine that you need the user to know it's just sugar it's just eggs it's just margarine okay all something like that so think about that less is more with regards to that ingredient stuff but if you can show your expertise then you're good after we've done the ingredients, then boom, right next to the next section is step-by-step. -step. You can say step-by-step -step directions. You can say how to make this recipe. You can say, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a couple other different ways to do it. But what we don't need to do is we don't need to say step-by-step -step instructions to make this orange cranberry sauce. They already know. They know what they know what they're on. Google knows what they're on. So you just do the step-by-step -step instructions, and then you have to decide. Am I going to use individual process shots or am I going to use process shot collages? There is no SEO benefit with regard to either of those. They both work exceptionally well. If you want to use collages and have, say, a, a four shot and then another four shot and then another four shot, maybe it's a complicated recipe so that way you don't have to gum up the whole post with 16 step-by-step -step photos, 
that's great. But if it's a simpler recipe where you're only needing four or six separate process shots, then sure, just do each of them individually and you'll be fine. So we just do step-by-step -step step -step instructions. Here's step one, here's step two, done. And then we get down below that. That's the next section, the next H2 section is FAQs and expert tips. And this is where now, did you move to the block editor or were you not on the block editor yet? When, when... I, I moved to it, but now I'm back to the old block. Oh, so you're, just, you're back to classic. I had to do the block one to make the home page. Got it. Okay. But you're back to classic. Yeah. On it. Now you have the ability to go back and forth. Okay. And I'm going to turn, I'll look and I'll turn that on for you. So you have, you can ability to edit each of your recipes in either classic or block editor. Now I will tell you, Crystal, that long term, you will do better with the block editor. So you might want to start slowly teaching yourself how to use the block editor. You're going to be shocked at how much easier it is for your process because you can start making what are called reusable blocks. So you can have like a block for your call to action and you just pop that at the bottom above the recipe card going forward on everything you do. Or maybe you want to do FAQs. Well, FAQs are so much easier to do with the block editor because we just pop in the Yoast FAQ block and then it, it has a section for the question and a section for the answer. And you just, it's telescoping and it just goes down depending upon how many questions and answers you want to use. Now, the thing about the block editor that's so important is that not only is this, of course, the future, whatever Google wants everyone to use, or not Google, but WordPress, but it's also faster and it's cleaner. There's less code involved. But most importantly, if you use something like FAQ schema, you can't use FAQ schema on the classic editor. It requires you to take it go to an external tool, mark it up, then paste it into the post. Whereas if you're on the block editor, when you use an FAQ block, it's already marking up the content behind the scenes for the carousels. Okay, yeah, that was on my list of questions to ask you. I was like, I didn't know there was an FAQ schema. How do I add it? Well, yeah, so now you know. If, and I'm going to show you some examples of how to do it if we were on a block editor today. Okay, so enough of my rambling. I know I've gone over a little bit. So moving over to leg number three which is the offsite factors that go into your success as a blocker. You have a very strong backlink profile. That The average person that I audit has about 1,100 linking root domains, and you're at like 2,200 or 2,700. Let me see here really quick. Yeah, 2,500, my bad. So you have 2,500 plus linking root domains. That's unique sites that are linking into you. That's a very strong number. What does that mean? Well, it means that it acts as spackle. It will cover up mistakes you've made on the content and the technical sites. And that's good. My, my battery's getting low, so I'm gonna move to plug it in. in case okay. You to... Yeah, no problem, no problem. Just let me know when you're ready. Now, where are you located? Where are you, where, where are you based? Uh, I'm in Mars, Mars, Pennsylvania. Mars, Pennsylvania, no kidding. Now, is that where the Mars factory is located by chance? No. The chocolate no. factory? How far are you from like Hershey's? Other side of the state. Oh, other um, side of the state. Okay. 30, 30 minutes from Pittsburgh. Okay. Okay. You know, I have never had the pleasure of visiting Pennsylvania. I have flown over it a couple times, but I've never, never visited. So that's on my list of things to do. Up, oh, you dropped that again. Let me see. Can you hear me? Okay, good. All right. So, Crystal, you have a strong backlink profile. That's very important. It's going to act as spackle to overcome mistakes on the technical side and content side. So what we want to do is we want to dial in as much of the content and the technical issues as we can because then we're going to be able to supplement that backlink profile as, as much as possible. You'll be able to spring forward a lot faster than other sites. Now tell me about your email list. How many people do you have on your email list right now? I don't want to talk about it. It's really bad. Uh, all good. All good. A couple hundred, a couple thousand. What is it? Thousand. Okay. Now, I will tell you that on your level, a site with your content and your backlink profile, I will tell you where you should be. You should be at about 7,500 to 10,000 minimum. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get there and you can't get there fast. I'm going to send you information on what's called Facebook remarketing. And I think I've mentioned it in the audit and I'm going to mention it in the follow-up. Here's how Facebook remarketing works. Currently, you have 100 people visiting your site. Maybe half of 1% signs up for your existing email list. Maybe you're using e email embeds. Maybe you have a pop-up, whatever. 
but every one of those people is on Facebook. So what we do is we install a pixel on your site and it fires and tags everyone who visits your site. Then you follow those people over to Facebook and you remarket them. You say, hey, remember me? I'm Crystal. You were on my site. You didn't sign up. Here's five free recipes or here's an ebook. It's some kind of an offer that you're going to come up with. And you're going to be shocked at how many of those people sign up for your email list. And you're going to be able to grow your email list pretty fast. This is an example of a paid marketing campaign. It's a PPC campaign. Sometimes it costs about 20 cents for a sign up. Sometimes it could be 50 or 60 cents. I'm going to send you all the information you need to reach out to my colleague, Susan Winograd, who's based in Virginia. And she can, she either, you have two options. She can do a consult with you and tell you how, how it all works, even whitelist it, set it all up for you. Or she'll provide you information on her course and it's all self-directed. You just take her course, you learn how to do it, you get going. This is something that several of your competitors have been doing for a while. I've audited most of them. So this is effective. This is something bigger bloggers have been doing for quite a while. <clears throat> but unlike pop-ups, which can be annoying, and unlike you know email embeds, which don't function as well as they used to, Facebook remarketing is a relatively good way for you to just market to people who you know are already interested in you because they've already visited. Okay. The only other thing is the accessibility. I, I'm going to go ahead and you never, I, did I send you the information when you onboarded to reach out to Kim Crossberg to possibly get a, an accessibility threat assessment with her? Did I send all that information? Up, uh, oh, I can't hear you. Can you say that again? A little better, a little better. Um, Let me just turn up my, give me a minute here. Okay. Yeah, try now. Um, you had mentioned her as the audit person. Okay, good. I'm going to send all the information for you in your follow-up today. The follow-up crystal will be like 30 pages, and it'll be literally just because I'm wordy. And it'll just be a review of everything in the audit. I'll make a note. Okay, here are the issues that we still need to work on. Here's a list of vetted professionals that can help you every step of the way. If you want to reach out to a VA, I'm going to give you a couple of VAs. If you want to do a, a, an ADA accessibility audit, this is Kim's information. If you want to do the, the email, this is Susan. If you decide to ever switch hosting or, or do new support, here's all of Andrew's information, all of it. And what you're going to do after we get off the call today is you're just going to, you're going to send me your next couple of recipes and I'm going to grade them. Okay, and that's how we're going to make sure that we dial everything in. Like I said, you've already done quite a bit, so we probably won't have to spend too much time doing the live auditing. But we're, what we're going to do today is I'm going to go in, kind of show you how the content auditing works. I'm going to go over that recipe that I graded for you, and then we're going to make sure that Search Console, you know how to use Search Console, that we've run Broken Link Checker, installed all those plugins, and go from there. Okay? All righty. So just let me know when you can see my screen. We're going to do some screen sharing here. You should be able to see the waterfall. Oh yeah, I see it. Okay, should pop right in there. Okay, let me know when you can see this. Do you see the, this is your drive, your Google Drive folder? Oh, is it still taking a while? Okay, so you can see the cursor moving around? Yep. Okay, good. So this is, again, your Google Drive folder. We're going to pop it in here. You've already accessed this. You're in a unique situation, and I was going to add you. I was going to ask you, how are you able to get by running both Gourmet Ads and AdThrive? I would think that, that AdThrive would want to, like, make sure that you don't run those so that they can get all of the traffic assigned to them. How does that work? Um, so when it first started, um, I think I want to say Andy is their leader. Uh huh. Um, had a conference call with him. Um, he okayed it because I had to sign like an NDA and stuff. Got and it. Was, Got it. Okay, because I'll be honest with you, I've never seen it, and that's fine. I was just kind of more curious than anything else. So, all right. So the very first thing that we're going to look at today is I wanted you to see the traffic overview. So this is everything on your site that's generating traffic and not generating traffic from Google. You see the 1,078 URLs? 
the vast majority of those of these of these URLs here are all that old beauty cosmetic review all that content you've already deleted most of that so that's going to help you do you see that this is the content that's generating all the traffic for you see how there's only about hundred and fifty URLs here that's pretty crazy considering how many URLs you still have on your site almost 500 but again you've you've already deleted a lot so that's good but our goal is to move as much of the red over to the green as we can okay and that's where this audit comes into play if you look at this the no organic traffic breakdown you could see here that a lot of this content I, I've tried to make it as easy as possible for you I've sorted it by impressions so what this means is that Google liked this Cape Cotter drink enough to give it 5,000 impressions in search which means that 5,000 people saw it but it's clearly far enough back that it's not translated into clicks so this means that it's on page three of Google so your goal is to ask yourself, how can I move this to page one? And we can do that by doing several things that you've probably seen in the audit already, including the fact that we want to move to process shots. We want to do a shot of the ingredients. We probably want to look at taking this out a little bit. We're going to unlink the image here. We're going to look at view image info on this really quickly. See how you just said Cape Cotter drink? That's not going to be enough. And that's also kind of for for accessibility instead you know again I would have no idea what a Cape Cotter drink is and neither would someone who's on an accessibility reader so in this case you should have said a this is a Cape Cotter drink red a red Cape Cotter drink made with cranberry juice and vodka with a lime garnish that's what we would have said on this specifically down here, you said if you're not a fan of overtly sweet cocktails, Cape Cutter will be good for you. This is an example of a pretty thin post. Absolutely no reason to use a table of contents on this. There's not enough content to justify it. So in this case, we would go down and we'd remove this specifically, and we would honestly consider republishing this. We would have, this is a nice section here, only this isn't, see how this doesn't read conversationally? So instead, we would say, if you're looking for a relaxing, refreshing summer cocktail, uh, look, check out my Cape Cotter drink. It's made with tart cranberry juice and smooth vodka, uh, and it's easy to make. It only takes four ingredients and can be ready in two minutes. That's how I would have rewritten that. I would have rewritten the teaser text to sell the user on why this Cape Cotter drink is worth investing in. Then right down here, Instead of, you have this my latest video here and then you have an ad. That's something you want to watch. See how you went from image, video, ad. We don't tend to want to have three of those ever in a row. In a, in a row. So that's something, especially on mobile, will look very poor. So I want you to understand that whenever you're looking at these pages, make sure you check them on mobile and see if we can improve the experience. Maybe we block out this ad or something. What we should have done next is we should have had a couple paragraphs on is there a history about this Cape Cotter drink? Where did it come from? What is it? What is it about this drink that's worth it for the user? So if I would have typed in Cape Cotter drink here, here it is. The Cape Cotter, Cape Cotter is a type of cocktail consisting. I would have probably gone over to Wikipedia and found out a little bit when this came to be. So it's coming from the Sea Breeze, Bay Breeze. Here it is. The drink was conceived by Ocean Spray. Did you mention that this drink, drink was conceived by Ocean Spray anywhere in your content? No, that would have been that would have been a good piece of information. And see how the Cape Cotter dates from the early 1960s? Because the drink, with your authority, you have the ability to get most of your content to rank right away. But you also have to provide better quality content. So in this case, what I would have done, I'd republish this. I'd basically gut this entire post, gut this entire post, and we're going to republish this. Oh, I'm going to fix this. 
Is there a reason that this is capital? I don't really like that. I'll, I'll, I'll see if we can fix it. I'm not a fan of the having being all capital letters. I'll see if we can fix that today. So in this case here, nice teaser text above the fold. Then we would have a couple of paragraphs. Here's why this recipe works, where you'd say the Cape Cotter was founded in the early 1960s. It was, it was made by Ocean Spray to sell more cranberry juice, but it's also a very flavorful drink because it's so easy to make. And then I would have had a photo of the ingredients. Now, if you're looking at some great cocktail recipes to, if you ever want inspiration, I want you to take a look at Dishes Delish. This is Elaine's site, and she does a lot of cocktail recipes, and they're very good. If you ever need cocktail, let's get this, recipe inspiration, go over and look at Elaine's site. She has had several of her cocktails picked up on HBO and, uh, and elsewhere. Now, probably her best cocktail is this one, the Ultimate Cadillac Margarita. It's literally like the top post in Google. Now, you can see here that she does a really good job with details. She talks about the whole history of the Grand Marnier and the and the and the the whole cocktail. Then she gets down here. This is her only mistake. And I'm not going to have her change it because the post does well. But you see how she put the questions before the FAQ, the FAQ before the step by step? We don't want to do that. But she talks about what are the premium ingredients. This should have been moved up here below the history. So she talks about the premium ingredients here. And then she has some helpful tips. Then she has the best mix. And then she has how to make it right here. Do you see how she has various steps here? A, B, C, D, whatever. I'm going to go and see if we can find the jelly shot one. Now let's go to, let's go to that one here. Oh, she just posted this on the 5th. Now, do you see how she has the step-by-step? -step? Gather the ingredients. Nice photo right there of the ingredients. Step two. Measure the three ounces of vodka. See how that she does that? Step three, measure three ounces of lime juice. Look at that. And then you, you put everything together. Now, this is the kind of detailed cocktail recipe that's going to do well. But honestly, you'll do better if you kind of correct some of the mistakes she's making. You have a section here on why this recipe works. Then you, you move the helpful tips below the how to make this section, but the how to make selection is great. She does a really good job with that. And you can see the difference in the quality. And then she has other linked recipes right here. And then she has a nice call to action above the recipe card. You see that? The call to action is, again, toddlers and drunk adults. You're just going to tell them, here's what I want to see in this recipe. And then she has a nice, fully enhanced recipe card. This is linked. I'm not a fan of equipment links because this is horribly, this will horribly increase your DOM nodes, so I wouldn't do that. But she has good notes. She has good, helpful tips in her recipe card. Oops. Now, I'm going to show you, I think I, I linked to these in your follow-up, but I'm going to show you some great templates to take a look at that are on, uh, some of them are on your own theme. We're going to look at these three specifically. Now, going back to our content here, this is an example of, would you consider this drink a seasonal drink? I can't hear you. you. You dropped out a little bit. Yeah, I know. All good. All right. I don't. I don't think so. I don't. Okay, uh, and it's fine. I mean, if you think that this would be relevant to anyone, we put it in bucket number one. Bucket number one is content that you can update today, tomorrow, or next week. It's relevant year round. Now, this is more of a. Honestly, this is probably going to be better for spring or summer, but it's fine, especially if someone was looking for a unique idea for their party. Because this is seasonal because it uses cranberry juice. So that's actually something maybe you could 
line this up with Thanksgiving coming up. So this might be, hey, if you guys want a nice selection for your next Thanksgiving meal, look at my Cape Cotter drink, which is made with a nice raspberry, you know, rice cranberry juice. So you, this could be bucket number one. All You could publish this all year round, or it could be bucket number two seasonal content. What about this one, homemade shamrock shake? I think Clearly, I right? Bucket number two. You're not going to touch this at all until next March, right? Or and when Google st or when McDonald's starts to come out with the Shamrock Shake, the minute Google announces their the minute McDonald's announces they're coming out with their Shamrock Shake, you should have this ready to go. Now, what about this one? This is bucket number one, right? Because we have Frosties year round. What about Bailey's Hot Chocolate? This is more winter. This is more fall winter. So this is one that we probably look at right now. Bucket number one and bucket number two. And then there at the Manhattan Clam, Ch Clam Chowder, this is absolutely right now. This is fall. What about the no bake banana split dessert cheesecake? You can have that year round. So that's bucket number one. And then the ice cream cone cupcakes. I have a question for mm -hmm. you on that. Yeah. What do you think about this? Is this uh, year round? Is it seasonal? So I think it's year round, but I don't think it will ever rank because if you Google ice cream cone mm -hmm. cupcakes or looking to make, you know, the ice, it's like you bake the cupcake in the ice cream cone. Like that's what all the top results are versus mine just looks like an ice cream cone. So I'm sure on the, the now, merits of that what did you use post. for a focus keyword? Ice cream cone cupcakes, was that your focus keyword? I think so. Whoops. Okay, you see right here, look at the volume. Do you understand where this is coming from? I'm using a plugin called Keywords Everywhere. Have you ever used Keywords Everywhere? I think I have it, but it's disabled. I would absolutely enable it because you can buy literally 100,000 credits for $10. $10 and they will last you for, in your case, probably a year. Now you can see here right away, this absolutely is something that you need to be revisiting. That's plenty of, that's plenty of, um, volume. So, but I feel like, I feel like my recipe doesn't match the intent of the user on this one. I feel like they want the thing inside the ice cream cone, not something that looks like an ice cream cone. Yeah, I get it, but I just want to be clear as well. You've over-optimized this too, okay? So this might be an example of maybe before you decide to take it off completely, you redo this and see if we can get it to rank based upon the checklist you now have access to, okay? Because here's the thing. This is, this is very, very important. Let me go back over here to... You are getting impressions. This is Google telling you, we are ranking you for this. You are just so far back that you're not getting clicks. Why are you so far back? Well, the photos could be improved. You should be inserting photos at 1200 pixels wide. So that they're, they, they, so that you have a chance of garnering any discover traffic you want with this. Um, I don't see a problem with that ice cream cone cupcakes with chocolate buttercream. That's probably a fine alt tag. You've got two posts, two, you've got, are, do you have any actual, yeah. Here's the bottom line for you. This is just not a quality post. You didn't use process shots. You, you've used the same photo four times. There's no, um, you put some tips down here, ice cream cupcake tips. No FAQs, there's links here, there's no call to action, and we could actually do a much better job. I'm actually going to go in and set up a new recipe template for you today, if that's okay, just so that we can actually can see kind of the difference in quality with what we're going to do. But there's things that you can do. Oh, by the way, see these tags? 
we're going to remove all those today. We've no index tags, so we don't want to start linking to tags site-wide because that's a waste of, that's a waste of crawl budget. Now, it, personally, I think that this is actually a good post. Again, you've just made a lot of mistakes. This isn't a quality teaser text. Um, you haven't used a real quality template. You put a table of contents here, but it's actually in the wrong place. And by the way, when we do a table of contents, I want you to take a look at what you've done here. And then I want you to take a look at this table of contents here. You see how the default is closed? That should be the default. And then look at this. See how we're only using H2? See how much cleaner that is? We only need to use H2s if you're going to be using a TOC plugin. Now, are you using the Lucky WP template? Do you remember what you're using? Not sure. Let's go ahead and take a look here. Not sure why it's so slow. Wow. Come on. There we go. Okay. Let's see. You're using the easy table of temp uh, contents right here. Okay. This is fine, but it's not as good as, say, this one right here. See this? This is the lucky table of contents. Okay. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to paste it over. Lucky WP table of contents. Smooth scroll, Gutenberg support. Very customizable. An example of it here. And then I'll paste that over. I'm going to show you a couple examples of recipes really quick. Here is an example of Darren. She is actually um, not on the block editor. So this gives you an idea of what you could do with your post. Nice, clean links, top of the fold. We've linked everything to her About Me page. She doesn't have her modified data, which I would prefer that she had, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. See how we have much better teaser text? This beautiful roasted squash salad with marinated chickpeas, burst food flavors. This is no boring salad. Serve this as a healthy main dish or holiday side salad. Now, whenever you have a recipe that you can make in less than 30 minutes, you should always say that at the top of the page. The reason she doesn't say it here is because look how long this recipe takes. Wow. Okay? All right. Now. She has the nice teaser text here. Look at that nice photo there. If we were to look at the photo, in her case, she's got 700 pixels wide. I would have preferred that she loaded in a 1,200 pixel image wide, but all I can do is tell the bloggers what to do. They have to do it. Now, in her case, though, this is a kale salad topped with squash, chickpeas, cranberries, hemp seeds, and walnuts. That is a great alt tag. See how descriptive that is? Now, your alt tag can have 12 to 16 words. So you have plenty of time. So you have plenty of space, 12 to 16 words. And then she went right down here and see how she immediately put in the table of contents. Look at this. Why make this recipe? Ingredient notes, step-by-step -step instructions, FAQs and expert tips, related recipes, a video if you have it. Here's the recipe card. Look at how clean that is. And then she does a really good job. Why make this recipe? And then it's very simple. Now, this is just a guideline. I'm going to show you a couple other examples where they're using this exact same outline, but it just looks different. Okay? Now, in her case, in, 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 in um, Darren's case, in Darren's case, she didn't put a lot of detail here. See that? She didn't need to. No boring salad, vegan and gluten-free, perfect for holidays. See that? Very simple. Whereas, if we were to go over to Nora's site... She has a little bit more detail. Remember how I said about if you can whip this up in 30 minutes, you always say that? That's what she did over here. This is decadent strawberry cream cheese. She has a nice photo here. She has a, a, a very nice alt tag on it. Uh, you know what? We'll just look at it here.
And the alt tag on this says that a stack of stuffed French toast on a plate with fresh strawberries. Now, this is her, here's why this recipe works section right there. She just didn't include the H2. She says that this is perfect because she has kids and she always has kids on her plate. And then she says this is perfect because I use, this is great for extra special brunches or holidays.